All right, uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Um, my name is Enrique Zuniga, and uh, this is a meeting of the Gaming Commission. Today is uh, July 26, um, 2018, and this is meeting number 248. Chairman Crosby and uh, Commissioner Cameron are away in what turned out to be a uh, working vacation. Um, but uh, we have them uh, dialed into the phone. Uh, I need to establish um, that you can hear us okay. Chairman Crosby, can you hear me? I can hear you fine, but I don't see the live stream up. Is it up? Oh, here it is. I got it. It's a delay. It, it'll be on a delay for about 30 seconds. Yes. Oh. All right. It, it's running, so running, running behind. behind. Yeah, the, the, the video streaming has a few seconds of delay, so uh, our advice, uh, Chairman, is that you uh, listen to the conversation on the phone and right. mute, mute the stream. Got it. Um, Commissioner Cameron, can you hear us okay? Uh, I can hear you loud and clear, Commissioner Zuniga. Very good. Um, Commissioner Stebbins, can you speak into the microphone uh, to see if they can hear us okay? Uh, Probably it can. I think they can now. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so we've established that uh, you can hear us all votes. If we have any votes, as uh, the regulations require, will be taken by roll call. Um, and uh, we'll proceed uh, accordingly. Okay. So, uh, first, um, the second order, order of business is. I suppose administrative update. We don't have uh, minutes uh, for this meeting? No, because we, we just did a meeting last week. Last week, okay. All right, so the, the item on the agenda uh, begins with the Director Petrosian. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so on my general update, I will tell you there is no other update right now other than the MGM opening. Um, and staff uh, continues to work uh, diligently. Um, we, I think uh, staff is starting to spend, and I will start to spend more time out in Springfield, certainly as August rolls around. I anticipate that we will have a meeting next week out in Springfield, and that meeting will, um, I hope, uh, culminate in a potential vote by the commission to delegate Commissioner Stebbins with the authority um, to uh, issue a uh, temporary certificate of occupancy later in the month when certain preconditions are met by MGM. But um, so uh, just to give you and the public a heads up, I anticipate next Thursday, August 2nd, um, a meeting potentially starting early afternoon around lunchtime. Um, that will be the culmination of staff's presentation work on checking on license conditions, RFA2 conditions, regulatory gaming conditions, all those the commission that would uh, give them, empower them, uh, hopefully to uh, delegate to Commissioner Stebbins that authority, so. Uh, I do want to clarify for the record, the, um, the certificate of operations is what, what you meant to say. Yeah, you say certificate say of occupancy. occupancy. Yeah, no, occupancy, um, we are. Occupancy is by the city of Springfield, but. Good, uh, good news will, is we're not in that business. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, you're right, operations, gaming operations. We will issue yeah, the certificate absolutely. of operations. Um, the can we take, can I interrupt one second? Can we take, yes, go ahead, uh, Chairman. I can't, uh, I can't hear uh, that, that very well. Is there any way that can be, Gail, can you hear that? Is it? Is um, it it's not as clear as the commissioners, but I, I can, I can hear it. Is it, um, they, they need, uh, they need that, oh, um, hold on, hold on one second. Yes, I think we, um, discovered the source. It's the speaker of the phone. Try that With, now. Without paraphrasing a commercial, can you hear me now? Oh, that's yeah. Uh, yeah, that that is much much better. Okay, I will there very briefly go over what I said, which is um, staff is working hard, and we're spending a lot more time out in Springfield, and we anticipate a meeting next Thursday, um, with which staff would present to the commission all the regulatory license conditions commitments. Uh, regulatory gaming preparations and everything which we anticipate would empower the Commission to make a decision to delegate to Commissioner Stebbins the authority uh, later in August to um, 
issue a temporary certificate of operations um, for the uh, gaming establishment at MGM Springfield. Uh, so that's what we anticipate happening next Thursday, August 2nd. Thank you, Director. Um, I actually, we have a practice of recognizing our elected officials uh, whenever they attend our meetings. Yeah, so there are, there are, thank there you, are, there are there representatives are. from Senator Brady's office here today. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for reminding me of that. Thank you. Exactly. Yep. Um, so, uh, which leads me to the next item, which is the, uh, we had received a letter from representatives of MG&E uh, which you would remember was a uh, applicant for the Region C commercial license. Um, I think I had updated the commission that we had received that letter in June. Um, I anticipated potentially addressing it sometime later, sometime in July. I know for the calendar we're still in July. Um, and what I had done is I'd asked staff, when I say staff, I mean uh, the legal department to look at both the legal, some of the legal and policy issues involved um, in that direct letters request and sort of the implication of Regency again. So what I'd like to do is you have a memo in your packet from our legal counsel. I'd like to turn it over to General Counsel Blue to explain some of staff's thinking at this time. Good morning, commissioners. Um, you have in your packet a memo from me and, and my team. And the memo outlines the um, process by which Regency was considered. It was very instructive to go back and look at some of that to realize how long we considered Regency. Um, and then attached to the memo is a list of items that the Commission may want to consider. I think just as a, a practical matter, the way the Commission awards a Category 1 gaming establishment license is in our regulations. It's very specific. It is the regs are drafted to require a competitive, open kind of process with an evaluation of, a, of the long and detailed application that we have. We do not, at this time, have a process in our regulations for a reconsideration or an, the award of a license in a process that may be different from what we already have. So that's kind of the fundamental starting place. Other than that, you'll see from our memo there are a lot of things that have changed in the region. There's a lot of things that we understand a little bit better or differently now that we've been through the process of opening PPC and now getting close to opening MGM. So I put that out there for your consideration. Whatever you uh, determine you'd like staff to do and you'd like us to proceed, uh, we would be happy to do that. Thank you. Um, yeah, we had received that uh, letter from MG&E that uh, you outlined, Director. Uh, I found your memo very helpful. Um, Council Blue. Um, I want to go around and get uh, comments from my, my fellow commissioners on this uh, matter. Um, Commissioner O'Brien, do you have some uh, thoughts on these uh, in terms documents? Of, in terms of where we stand today and in light of the memo, um, my recommendation would be to set this for a time in the fall when we can truly ask questions of the process and, and come up with a plan for how to go forward. I didn't, I didn't quite hear that, Commissioner. Uh, My recommendation with everything that the Commission has before it for the summer would be that we set a date um, to have a further discussion on process about this letter in the fall. Sometime in September would be my suggestion. In other words, start thinking about a, a process uh, at a later time. A process or a response. Or a response. Um, Commissioner uh, Stebbins, do you have any Thoughts on uh, the contents of the memo or the or the letter? Um, you know, it was it was um, interesting letter to for us to get. Um, you know, certainly uh, I don't think the the message has been lost on us. And um, I know former Commissioner McDonald, uh, being a, a Southeast native, would con uh, uh, continue to raise the the question with us of you know what about the southeast region of Massachusetts, and again, not being left behind, I think we all take that into consideration. Um, you know, I, I know this is not up for a vote, so I, I think to Commissioner O'Brien's point, there's no action we can take on either the request or future steps for us to take without, again, kind of shifting this down the road to, to another meeting, and again, you know, hopefully after uh, 
uh, we can move past the opening of, uh, of MGM so that uh, staff can turn their attention to a lot of the work um, and questions that were raised in, in General Counsel Blue's memo. Uh, personally, I, I have um, several areas of concern within, within the request that we got from MG&E's legal counsel, but um, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to take those up at you know, the appropriate time. I don't, I don't think there's any harm with raising whatever issues are on your mind. I think it's, it, it clearly makes sense. We've got our hands full until uh, September for any significant work. I think that's clear. But um, if there's anything wrong with doing whatever it thought we have, um, the, uh, some of the issues now. Um, Commissioner um, Cameron, do you have uh, other uh, comments in addition to what, no, do you have comments on, on, on this matter? Uh, I do, I do, Commissioner. Uh, like you, I found the uh, staff menu, uh, the staff uh, memo helpful, and I uh, certainly, I know that we're not voting on any of this, but I certainly agree with many of the recommendations. Um, you know, it's been a, a number of years. And I, I certainly think that would uh, lend itself to a new uh, gaming market analysis of the uh, of the region, as well as the um, the analysis of what is happening here in Massachusetts. So I mean, I, I could go through a number of these issues that they recommended, but uh, I certainly agree with most of them. Many many things have changed. Um, the environment has certainly changed. The gaming environment, and I think a review would be a very good place to start. Um, Overall, I you know I don't I don't think the um, uh, the uh, the many of the circumstances that caused us to uh, deny that license have changed from now. Uh, so I'm just uh, giving that as, as a thought that I just um, you know the, the saturation point is always something we're looking for and what's best for the Commonwealth. And as we all know, we did not have a competitive environment in, in Region C. And um, there were many factors for that, but um, I think uh, doing this analytical work will help us um, form a, an opinion on how to move forward in Region C. So I think those, many of those steps would be necessary for us to have a better view of the environment now. Right. There's cer certainly a lot of things that have um, changed uh, outside, even outside of the gaming um, region of Massachusetts, uh, but, uh, but in our um, contiguous uh, states that bear into a lot of these, um, the discussions that we had back then. Um, so I just want to back up a little bit. The, um, uh, the, uh, the, the people from MG&E do say, do point out that um, we had issued a public statement relative to uh, having a public discussion um, on, on this matter at a later time, which is what they're asking us to do now. Uh, do, I, do I get a sense from uh, commissioners that this is something that we would want to schedule for, uh, for a later time, uh, like in the fall? We could conduct a public hearing, for example, like we've done in the past. We could also um, ask for public comment, uh, like we have done in the past. Is this something that uh, any of the commissioners would agree with? Commissioner Stebbins, before we get into the phone, uh, Commissioner Stebbins. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I certainly look at this request as is generating, this request generates two questions for us. I think there's a separate track of how do, re, how do we reply to legal counsel from MG&E's request, and then secondly, how the commission moves forward and reconsiders a lot of the questions, again, raised in General Counsel Blue's uh, memo about uh, Region C, things that may uh, have changed, things that might be different, you know, certainly a, a public hearing or a public meeting opportunity to get some feedback and input would, uh, uh, would be merited. So, you know, there's, there's kind of dual paths of decisions I think we need to, uh, to uh, consider. Okay. Is that uh, along the lines of what you were also uh, pointing out, Commissioner O'Brien? Yes, I think that, as he said, there's two issues. One is a, a sort of discrete response to the letter, and then the other one is um, what, if any, process follows independent of that response. 
Okay. Um, absolutely, I think is something that should be addressed at a later time with a little more definition on our part about what that conversation entails. But absolutely, public comment um, is always welcome. Okay, um, Chairman Crosby. Yeah, um, I had a couple of thoughts related to that. Um, I think the idea of doing the back, you know, the sort of the the, the environmental scan makes sense. Um, I don't think it would make sense to get that started. There's no point in putting that off. You know, we could, if we just, if we wanted to use HLT, who's always done our analysis before, we could frame um, the question, um, uh, the commissioners in that you in particular are good at, at that and have kind of managed the relationship with HLT. Um, and I would think it would make sense for you to go off and talk to them and have, have them so send us a proposed scope on how they would look at the issues that are raised in items one and two and get that going. There's no, you know, there's no point in, in waiting until, um, until September to get that started. Maybe they could be ready by September so we'd have that for us. Similarly, I think um, we're asking for comment now. I think the idea probably of holding a hearing is, is a good idea. We might want to go out in the community to do one or more as we have in the past. But I think it would be great to to ask for feedback now. We have a letter from Senator Brady and we have a letter from uh, one of the churches, um, but that's the only direct connection we've had other than from um, the letter from Mass Gaming, and I think it would be good for us to ask for that now um, so we get a sense of, of what's going on out there. Um, and then I, I talked with Catherine and Todd about this, but I think it might be worth taking a shot at seeing whether there's other commercial interest. Um, in, in, as everybody knows, when we spent, I guess, practically years um, the last time around trying to encourage commercial applications, and at the end of the day, there was only one company um, and one community that could get together and actually make an application. Um, I had asked Todd to think about whether would there be some screener questions like could we could we now um, simply ask for statements of interest um, with enough substance in the request that we could screen out the complete Mickey Mouse proposals. I'm not sure we can do this. You know, as I said, I talked about this with Catherine and Todd and asked Todd to think about the kinds of questions we might ask, but. It would be useful for us to, if it turned out hypothetically, and this is not necessarily the case at all, but if it turned out hypothetically that there were no other parties who expressed interest, then we might want to rethink whether we want to go through the whole RFA2 process over again with only one party interested, which would be MG and D. Um, so that would be a, a third thing that if we could if we could request statements of interest with some degree of substance, that would also prepare us for September when we get around to, um, to dealing with this. Let me let me just react quickly to that because um, this is a little bit what Council Blue was saying initially that um, our regulations, actually the statute, does not really contemplate for. Um, what, uh, what you seem to be alluding, just simply asking a statement of interest or, um, or just a flat out reconsideration of, of an applicant in the past. So um, while the statement of interest or the scanning, the market scanning is intriguing, we would, I would be a lot more comfortable f finding a, a, a way to first analyze whether it fits with first the statute and if necessary, whether we would need to change regulations to accommodate that. Uh, I mean, I think the idea is intriguing, but but uh, I go back mostly to how this was set up initially, and that was a competitive process that Council Blue was um, was referring to. Um, I want to make sure I go in, 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 in the same order. Oh, did, I'm sorry, uh, Chairman, did you have a response to that? Well, yeah, I just want to make sure I understood. Were you saying that um, you didn't think we could ask for requests for statements of interest? 
in, within our existing works? No, I'm, sa I'm saying I would first want to make sure that uh, our legal department thinks that it fits within the confines of the statute and our regulations uh, to, to do that. Okay, well that's fine. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't see why asking for a statement of interest would be an issue. We, we certainly, as a practical matter, have that going on, um, you know, before, you know, when we were all going around the Commonwealth asking for people to express interest in the, in the uh, various regions. Well, before we, began, before we began the RFA one process, but obviously I don't have any problem with checking with with Catherine to make sure that's that fits. We will. I, I mean, the, my my sense is that that expression of interest was the RFA one per se and the four hundred thousand non reimbursable uh, fee that the statute um, uh, provided for. But 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 the point is well taken, um, and we'll 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 check with staff on that, um, Commissioner Cameron. Okay. Could I, wait, could I just finish up? I'm sorry to, to, to interrupt here, but I just had a couple of other thoughts. One was I thought that there was kind of a misimpression in the MG&E letter um, that was worth addressing. Um, it, the letter made it sound as if the only issue that the commissioners dealt with in, uh, or the principal issue by far, the controlling issue that the commissioners dealt with when we decided not to award the license was the possibility of a tribal uh, casino. And um, I made a point of going back and reading our decision, and we, we, we certainly made reference from time to time to the tribal issue and whether or not the MG&E proposal properly accommodated the potential financial impact of that. But we were way, way more comprehensive in our concerns than simply the tribal issue. So I just, I just wanted to put that on the record. That was an important. That is very important. I was going to make actually that uh, that point uh, myself, um, and but it bears repeating uh, that from their letter, um, uh, the MGE uh, uh, people make it seem as though the only. Um, or certainly the most important factor in um, their not being awarded the license uh, was the status of the tribe. And there was indeed a lot of other factors that played into uh, ultimately the, the, the four to one decision not to award the license. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's an important uh, point of um, clarification for the record. Um, did, uh, Wait, I just have one more, sorry. Um, just the point that I'm trying to make is I think we can, I agree with everybody that, that we can't really deal with this right now in any substantive way, but we ought to get as much preparatory work done as we can uh, between now and mid to late September when we can turn our attention to this uh, full board. Um, and that's why I'm recommending that the, that the uh, suggestions one and two, we try to get that underway. Um, also, recommendations six, seven, eight, and nine. Uh, are things that I think that the legal department and staff can can be looking at, so that there are you know suggested answers to those questions um, when we're ready to go come say mid September. Uh, so we, we, soliciting community support, thinking about whether it's proper, it's reasonable to ask for statements of interest. Um, doing the recommendations one and two, getting those going, as, and that going as quickly as we can, and um, having staff follow through on recommendations six, seven, eight, and nine, uh, I think would make a lot of sense. And that would put us in a position to have a really, really robust conversation when we get started, rather than starting from ground zero. Yeah, there's a lot that uh, the staff can undertake. Um, my. Um uh, we'd have to check, for example, things how, um, whether we're still on their current contract with our consultants, for example, whether we can just extend them or we need to conduct another, another solicitation, for example, uh, to do that uh, market scan or market assessment. Uh, and uh, But that's, your point is well taken that uh, that's work that uh, we could undertake now. So uh, we'll, we'll turn to staff to see how we can start implementing the the tasks that are um, uh, more feasible to do in the short term. 
Um, Commissioner Cameron, did you want to um, react to any of these comments or, or make a, yes, a, a final I, point? I, I, yes, Commissioner. I just, I guess my question is more about process here. Um, and consensus of the Commission members with regard to any work now. Is it the right time to move forward with some of this work? I think we're talking about, um, and maybe and maybe there will be, but I, I mean, there's nothing for a vote on today's schedule. Um, but for example, a market analysis is really uh, an expensive proposition to do it properly. And I'm just, and maybe we do have a consensus to at least move forward with something like that. But uh, I think several of these steps require, um, you know, a, a good amount of work from staff. And do we have a consensus among the five of us to move forward with that? Or, or would those steps be needed to discuss in a meeting? I don't, I don't want to, you know, put this off, but I'm just wondering if we're... Um, if we really do have a consensus for timing, is this a, the right time to move forward with all of these steps? And I just haven't heard that from my fellow commissioners. And I, I'm weighing in my own mind what I think is appropriate right now. Um, even public comment. Do, does the public have enough information to comment wisely, or would it be appropriate for us to say, for example, um, you know, conduct the market analysis and then uh, ask for, a, you know, public I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out the process here. And um, what is what is your sense relative to your uh, weighing into that consensus question? What is your uh, feeling about uh, the timing for moving on any of these, um, all things being equal? Well, um, I I frankly think staff in particular probably has. Um, lots to do between now and September, and you know, I'm just wondering if if um, if if it makes any sense to move forward right now, trying to get some of these um, some of these issues addressed, or if it would uh, make more time uh, allow if, if if we should wait till say September after we open and and then address some of these issues. I'm just. I'm just trying to be cognizant of everybody's bandwidth and, you know, what the consensus is among among the five of us. And I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just not sure, um, you know, how I feel about it without more discussion with the five of us. Well, there seems to be I, one. Just, I'm, I'm one, sorry. Go ahead, one, uh, Chairman Crosby. Well, I was just going to be like, obviously, I agree with Mr. Cameron that if the staff doesn't feel like they've got the bandwidth to, to do like items 6 through 10 or 6 through 9, um, I would obviously agree with that. I mean, I, what, I'm, what, what, I'm, what I'm thinking is to the extent that we can get ourselves ready um, appropriately, I think that's constructive. You know, if, if we, if everything always takes longer than, you think, than we think it does, I think it's a fair question, not just from the standpoint of energy and e from the standpoint of everybody in southeastern mass it's a fair question about is it time for us once again to take a look at this i have no no opinion on it frankly uh, at this stage of the game but i think it's perfectly legitimate and, and i was going to i would have brought this up if mgme hadn't written it i was written this i was going to bring up to the commission you know should we again take a look at that region c and figure out what we do so um to the extent that we can prepare ourselves to be ready to go in September, uh, I just think that's constructive, that's all. Okay. Um, are there reactions from commissioners in the room? I, I, I'd want to follow up on what Commissioner Cameron said and, and maybe to clarify my initial statement, which was there are two issues on this agenda item. One is the response to the letter. Two is what, if any, process follows. And I do think moving in depth on anything beyond what is the response to the letter prior to September is premature and presupposes something will occur. And I think the appropriate step in September is, to, Cameron, to uh, Commissioner Cameron's point, is we come up with our response to that letter and then some consensus about what, if any, process follows before we're sending other things out for bidding and, and other contract things mm -hmm. about testing the market. That's, that's where I stand. Yeah, actually, and, and that's where I stand as well. And that probably is the beginning of that consensus emerging that Commissioner Cameron was alluding. Um, I think you've, you've put it well, Commissioner O'Brien. 
um, let's, let's figure out the short run is a response to the letter and let's turn it back to staff to, uh, to do that and you know, we can do that in, in, in short order. Um, but the, um, the, way the, the, the issue that is more um, of careful consideration, uh, and I understand Commissioner, uh, Chairman Crosby's point about whatever we could do to prepare for is, is incumbent upon us, uh, is one of process and, um, and regulation changes, or, or if necessary, or uh, making additional commitments uh, uh, to consultants or studies or whatnot. Let's, let's uh, put off that discussion until later, certainly not before uh, the fall, um, is what, appear, what I seem to be hearing, given that there seems to be quite a bit of focus in, um, at this time in, uh, in the MGM opening. Uh, so if I could just summarize, I yes. think, where we are. Um, I would direct staff to focus their attention in the near term in the next 30 to 45 days on a draft response um, to the letter itself, the micro issue of the letter on the reconsideration, and to the extent possible, based on the discussion today, to anticipate some of the items that then may follow into a potential broader discussion about Region C, which could be everything from what would it take to do a new market study, what, if anything, if the Commission wanted to do you know, find out what the market would bear through an expression of interest. Is that something we could legally do under the statute and regulations? And if not, what, uh, what changes would need to be made? Right. And potentially, uh, maybe a series of uh, public comment questions based on the macro issue about Regency. Mm -hmm. That, is that my understanding? That is a good. That, that is a good summary. Any other reactions? Yeah, I, I would. I, I would only just you know forewarn ourselves that because we're taking up this issue right now, and we always have an open MGC comments line, that you know yeah. we may not have to wait for a public hearing before we start getting uh, uh, thoughtful letters, communications. I think even to the chairman's point, we may have potential applicants who weigh in through what is just a normal comment process that we always use. So we're, we're, we're starting uh, with this meeting, with this item being on the agenda, kind of restarting that conversation sure. and probably spurring a lot of comments already from the public. We're always open to public comment. Oh, absolutely. Any final thoughts, Commissioner O'Brien? No, I think we're good. Uh, it's a good Dr. Time. Erosion summarized it properly. Okay. Uh, any final thoughts? Uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Zuniga, just one thought. Does, does staff uh, have enough, have they heard from us on enough to start preparing uh, a response to that letter? Are there, are there any issues um, in that letter that we haven't discussed that they would feel um, or is it just strictly research they will be doing uh, with regard to items in the letter? I let you uh, thank you, Commissioner Cameron. I think we're good to get started. Um, and obviously, uh, if we have any questions or preliminary issues, we will circle back with the Commission. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that, that sounds like a plan. I, uh, I think it's a, it's a good discussion. Um, let's move on to the... So if we could, um, uh, Mr. Temporary Chairman, yeah. um, if we could uh, just switch up, I apologize, items uh, four and three and uh, move up items four. Director Griffin has committed to presenting at an outside forum um, at which he'd need to leave by about 11, 11 o'clock if possible. Okay. So you want to go to uh, item four? Yeah, now, please. At this point? Please. Okay. Thank you. Director Griffin. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Actually, Director, just one second. Uh, just in the event that any uh, of the Commissioners on the phone uh, leave the phone call, please let me know so that we can reflect that in the minutes. But we'll assume that you're still on, even if you're not um, talking, of course. Uh, Go ahead, Director. I'm joined by um, my colleague, uh, Ombudsman John Ziemba, 
um, and we're here to talk about the Boston Private Industry Council um, Mitigation Fund redesignation. And so I'm going to actually um, turn it over to John to set some context. Thank you, Jill. Uh, by way of background, earlier this year, the Commission voted to award two workforce pilots in Region A. Uh, when we drafted the guidelines back uh, last December, we only anticipated that we would have one uh, workforce pilot in each region. However, given the importance of workforce development in each of the regions, the Commission did move forward with two $300,000 grants. Uh, however, it was clear at the time of the award of the Region A pilots um, that we would need to meet with the Boston PIC uh, regarding some of the specific grant spending categories and some of the uh, Commission's decisions regarding priorities under that grant. Um, we have met, uh, staff has already met with uh, Boston PIC and they have made the request that Jill will outline for you. Um, we also, during the meeting with, uh, with the Boston PIC, um, we also requested that they meet with the Metro North Regional Employment Board, um, and that meeting has occurred as well. As you recall, when we um, previously awarded two workforce pilots in Region B, we asked them to coordinate as well, uh, which they did um, subsequent to our, our award. And um, I think we have some good news in that regard here. So let me turn it back to Jill. So as you remember, um, you voted to approve $300,000 um, to the Private Industry Council um, um, grant. And um, um, the marketing and the data management um, staff advised that we um, would like to talk with the applicant um, following the vote and um, talk about the use of those funds. And so those are the um, uh, funds in question. The Private Industry Council has requested that rather than using them for marketing and data management, that they reprogram um, those funds um, to use for staff. And they indicated that they currently um, don't have staff capacity um, you know, at this time to handle um, the grant management. Um, staff thought that this was um, a reasonable use of these funds for this year. Um, now this is um, at 26,765. Obviously it's not enough for a full staff position. Um, however, um, the Private Industry Council has had conversations with other funders in the region and um, and has had some promising um, conversations about potential um, match of those funds. So. so is this request contingent on them getting matching funds or is this simply the request to release the funds? It, it's not contingent upon the matching funds. It's um, to utilize um, for consultant use or whatever they deem um, uh, appropriate. If, um, I've, I've had a chance to, to visit with Director Griffin on this issue. I was encouraged by the fact that the Boston pick, again, you know, you work with these entities, they have certain geographical boundaries they need to work in. Um, happy that Boston also put in an application. We awarded the application because obviously they covered the city of Boston, which is outside kind of the host communities regional employment or designated regional employment board. But I was happy to hear, you know, there's better alignment on projects because there's some cross collaboration that can happen because they're all sharing um, certain partners. Um, so I'm glad that they're like making some programmatic alignment through all this. Uh, I compliment them on, on kind of getting the administrative cost down to where it is. It now reflects less than 10% of the award, which I think is great. It certainly allows for more money to be put out for the programmatic use. Um, and, you know, if, you know, I know how REBS and PICs are stretched for financing, so I'm glad they're making this happen with this request. I'm glad that they're also pursuing some other money. And, you know, as, as I said before, when we went through this community mitigation grant, um, I, th I, th I still think it's a great news story for us to think about. 
$300,000 award to Metro North, $300,000 award to the Boston Pick, and leveraging other cash and in-kind contributions, we're putting close to about a million dollars on the street for workforce development for not only our licensee but for the for the uh, for the community. So I think that's um, I think that's even a, a I think that's an incredible news story. Um, so I wholeheartedly support your recommendation. I think it's great and great work to you and John for bringing the parties together. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner O'Brien, I wanted to just follow up on your question about the contingency. Um, uh, I had a conversation with the funder in question. Um, they need to bring it before their board like we are doing today, but it sounds very promising. So I, I want to let you know that. Um, and um, thank you, Commissioner Stebbins, for bringing up those um, points about um, the meeting and the collaboration. We're very encouraged, and I, and I did want to emphasize that the staffing um, we think appropriate for this year. In future years, we're hoping that, that the, and expecting that the two, um, you know, if they decide to reapply in the future, that they would come um, together as a single applicant, as like what happened in um, uh, Region B. But they um, had a promising meeting on the 24th of July. They talked about collaborating together to convene all the career counselors in the region um, to talk about and, and get updated um, regarding the Encore jobs um, and to talk about general hospitality needs um, of other employers in the region. They talked about training funds and best leveraging all the training funds. Um, and they um, talked about collaborating for outreach and community engagement and opening up training programs um, for all in, in the region. Um, you know, um, and developing a regional um, sector focus for hospitality. So we're very encouraged and, and think that um, reprogramming those uses with, with these um, collaborative, collab <coughs> efforts would be a really good use. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Director. Uh, any reactions from uh, Chairman Crosby on, on this topic? No, just to the, that it sounds great, and that, that the uh, discussion by Commissioner Stevens is really interesting and helpful. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Cameron? Uh, no, I agree. Collaboration uh, is what uh, everyone has been hoping would happen, and. Uh, you know, sharing those uh, those funds, and uh, as Director Griffin just explained, so now sounds sounds like a positive step. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's great when uh, when they when there's different groups um, trying to s strive for a common goal. Um, we really encourage um, efficiencies through collaboration. So I'm glad uh, to see that uh, in the future. So, is there a motion uh, from the request or any other discussion? Uh, if there's no other discussion, I'd move the um, that the commission approve uh, the use of twenty six thousand seven hundred sixty five dollars of the previously approved three hundred thousand dollar grant to the Boston Private Industry Council uh, towards a staff and consultant position. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Stebbins. Um, is, um, Commissioner, is there a second? Second. Okay, um, motions made and, and, and second. I'll go now in uh, roll call. Um, Commissioner Stebbins? Yes. Commissioner O'Brien? Yes. Chairman Crosby? Yes. Commissioner Cameron? Yes. And Commissioner Zuniga votes yes. The ayes have it unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Great work. Okay, the next item on the agenda would be Director Van der Linden. Is there a need or time to set up or transition? We're all set. Okay. Commissioner Zuniga. Uh, yes. I, I want to watch this presentation uh, with the video as well as the audio, um, which I can't do when I'm, when I'm hooked up live with these folks. We don't have any more votes to vote, right? No, we, uh, we don't have any more scheduled votes. So uh, 
I do want to watch the presentation, but I'm going to sign off out of the meeting formally and watch it on the several second delay. Okay. So we should note for the record then that uh, Chairman Crosby is leaving the meeting, although he will be watching the stream because he's clearly interested in the topic. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Director Vanderlyn. Great. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I am joined uh, by Drs. Uh, Heather Gray and Debbie LaPlante from the Cambridge Health Alliance Division on Addiction. Um, I've worked with both of these uh, fine people for the past several years now in, in evaluation of uh, various um, responsible gaming programs, including the GameSense program, which will be presented to you today, as well as uh, Play My Way and the Voluntary Self-Exclusion program. So thank you for coming. Um, as you know, in 2015, uh, Plain Ridge Park Casino opened up, um, and with it, um, Came the very first GameSense program information center in the United States. Um, at the GameSense information center, patrons can access a variety of information intended to increase informed player choice, including how games work, the probability of winning, an explanation of house advantage, and tips and tools to promote positive play. Um, the information is available in a variety of different formats, but probably most powerfully is when it comes from the, the knowledgeable and friendly GameSense advisors who have been there since the beginning, 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, our responsible gaming framework um, that the Commission adopted um, is recently version two, uh, just recently a few months ago, and version one back in 2014, um, adopts uh, uh, an evidence-based and precautionary approach, basically saying where evidence exists, we will use that evidence and we'll implement programs that, um, that are in line with that evidence-based approach. However, where there is an element of, of risk um, and a potential for harm, we won't sit back and wait for evidence to emerge. We will use a precautionary uh, approach. Um, basically, that the lack of scientific certainty should not and will not be a reason for to postpone measures to prevent harm. The GameSense program is really um, an example of our, our implementation of this precautionary approach. Uh, when the Commission first adopted GameSense and um, moved forward to the GameSense Information Center, while there was, was promising evidence that moved us in the direction of adopting this program, um, including um, that it, it fit very well with with the Commission's overall agenda and mission, um, the, the, the evidence was, was uncertain or it was, it was um, in its beginning stages. And so we took what I feel like a very aggressive step to evaluate this, this program. Um, what you will hear today is, is the accumulation of basically four um, evaluation efforts. Um, the information, um, it's very interesting, and I think that it's very promising to me um, as we continue down this road with GameSense. We'll use this, the, the information that's presented today, um, as we begin to, as we continue to think about how do we improve the GameSense program? What steps do we need to do to, to help um, our GameSense advisors be more successful, more effective in, in the work that they're doing? Um, and so, with that, I think I will go ahead and turn this over to um, uh, Dr. Gray, Dr. LaPlante. Yes. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Is this better? Uh, oh. see, oh, that's even better. That's even better. Good morning. Good morning. On behalf of Dr. LaPlante and the Division on Addiction, I'd like to thank the Commission for inviting us to do this research and to present on it this morning. Um, I'd like to start with a little context for the GameSense program, and Director Vanderlinden covered some of this, so I'll be brief. As you know, in 2011, Massachusetts passed the Expanded Gaming Act, and that act included several mandates designed to mitigate potential harm that might come from expanded gambling opportunities. And one of those was the requirement for on-site, uh, complementary, substance use, compulsive gambling, and mental health counseling. 
Just about three years after that, the Commission adopted the GameSense brand to fulfill this requirement. And it required that all new uh, gambling venues would provide space for a GameSense Information Center to be staffed by the Massachusetts Council on Compulsive Gambling. In the spring of 2015, you contracted with us at the Division on Addiction to evaluate GameSense and the other responsible gambling initiatives. As Director Vander Linden mentioned, those include the Play My Way Voluntary Budgeting System and the Voluntary Self-Exclusion Program. Shortly after that, Plain Ridge Park Casino opened, and with it opened the very first Game Sense program in the United States. And Massachusetts was a real leader here. Just this past year, as you might know, MGM implemented Game Sense throughout its properties in the United States. Um, so we took the first six months after Plain Ridge Park opened to develop a system for evaluating the program. We worked really closely with the Game Sense Advisors and they were wonderful partners in this, along with Director Vander Linden and Teresa Fiore. Um, so we used a lot of feedback from the Game Sense Advisors on how this system should work. They were willing to try lots of different things. And really the focus in these first six months was developing a system for the GameSense advisors to classify the interactions they were having with patrons on the floor and others. So from December 2015 to May 2016, we had our first wave of data collection and that became report one. Um, shortly after that started, the Sigma team went into the field and did their first survey of Plain Ridge Park uh, patrons. And they followed that up with another survey in the summer of 2016. That actually became, uh, part of that became our third report. Um, in August 2016, we made some refinements to our data collection system and launched our second wave of data collection, which also lasted six months. That became the basis for our second report. In May 2017, we conducted a survey with uh, Plain Ridge Park employees. That became our fourth report. And then just last month, we delivered our comprehensive evaluation of GameSense. And that brings us to today. Before you go there, Doctor, can sure. I just make one observation? Um, this commission, you, you made it seem in your remarks that, uh, that we adopted GameSense exclusively to fulfill the requirement of the on-site space for substance and mental health. But that was not our intention. Our intention was to adopt GameSense for the higher goal in the same paragraph in the legislation, uh, which includes um, a number of strategies, public health strategies, and uh, the overall mitigation of potential harm. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Okay, so now I'll get into a little bit more detail about our four reports. Report one summarized those first six months of data collection, and it included two sources of information. The first were checklists, or computerized records of services that the GameSense advisors uh, provided. The idea was that any time a GameSense advisor interacted with a patron or someone else, um, they were to use a, um, an iPad and to describe that interaction on some basic dimensions. Um, and then we also wanted to get the impressions of the people who were using the program. And that included mostly patrons, but also Plain Ridge Park staff and others. And so those became our visitor surveys. Report two took the same form as report one except whereas in report one, we focused a lot on uh, the user's satisfaction with the program. In report two, we turned more to their um, thoughts and behavior surrounding responsible gambling. The report three, as I mentioned, was our analysis of Sigma's patron intercepts. We only focused on the game sense questions. And um, report four was our analysis of our Plain Ridge Park Casino Employee Survey. So we situated um, all of this work within the REAIM framework. 
And that's a way to conceptualize the impact of a public health program. And you can see it includes five dimensions, which together spell out re-aim. The first dimension is reach, and that's the question of whether the right people are receiving the program. Effectiveness, is it working as intended? Adoption, is it being adopted in the right settings? Implementation, is it being implemented in the way that it was originally intended? And finally, maintenance, is it being sustained over time? As you'll notice in our presentation today, we focused mostly on the first of these dimensions, reach, um, and focused um, slightly less on effectiveness, just given the nature of the work that we did. So um, it's important if we are studying effectiveness to know um, the intended purpose of the program. And so here you see um, a section of the 2014 Responsible Gaming Framework. And that stated that GameSense was designed to serve as the patron's central point of contact for inquiries and enrollment into voluntary responsible gaming programs and services, including self-exclusion programs, play information and management systems, and educational tools to assess play risk, provide responsible gaming tips, and increase players' knowledge of how games work while dispelling common gambling myths. And that, that last part is important because we know that there are a lot of gambling myths that can contribute to gambling-related problems. So it's important to try to dispel those when possible. And um, this framework evolved. As you know, there's uh, an updated version of the Responsible Gaming Framework that came out in May of this year. Again, GameSense um, is um, in this framework designed to serve as a central point of contact. Um, and this framework adopts uh, a relatively new term of positive play. Um, and that is defined in the framework as gambling within personally affordable limits, being honest with oneself and others about one's gambling, and not being significantly negatively impacted by belief in luck or other superstitions. <coughs> so now I'm going to turn more towards our methodology. As I mentioned, we spent about six months working closely with the GameSense advisors on developing a system for them to categorize their interactions. And this was a system that we developed um, and that we are confident in um, as of uh, December of 2015. So they had four choices um, when they came to um, classify their interactions. One was simple. And this often includes something as simple as giving directions to something inside the casino or uh, providing a greeting. Um, maybe someone comes to the Game Sense Center to take a break to, to get a bottle of water and, and doesn't go beyond that. Instructive is when a Game Sense advisor delivers information about responsible gambling or problem gambling to the visitor. It's usually a patron, but could be someone else. And it's a one way interaction. It's the Game Sense advisor giving information, but it's not a, a conversation. Demonstration is just what it sounds like. So for instance, the Game Sense Advisor might use a demonstration of pulling a marble out of a bag and then putting it back in to show that um, slot machine play is independent um, from one play to the next and not like a conveyor belt where if you just wait long enough, then you'll get the win. And finally, exchange was the most um, substantive kind of interaction. And that was a real conversation between a Game Sense advisor and a visitor about responsible gambling or problem gambling. And we gave the Game Sense advisors a lot of information about what those terms meant. And um, we actually did a lot of training to make sure they understood all of these um, categories. Now, all of the surveys that I'll be presenting today um, from reports one and two come from visitors who had exchange interactions. So at the direction of the commission, we only surveyed visitors who had this kind of interaction with GameSense advisors. 
And we want to be cautious in stating that the results of our visitor surveys don't necessarily generalize to people who only had the other kinds of interactions. Okay, so now I can start to get to some findings, starting with report one. We found that in those first six months of data collection, the GameSense advisors recorded 5,659 interactions. And that translates into about 31 interactions each day. We asked how many people they interacted with, and the answer there was 9,342. This, we know, is somewhat of an underestimate because they didn't always record the number of people involved, but we know there were at least that many. Um, and that translates into about 52 visitors a day. Now, we got an estimate from Penn National about uh, how many patrons were coming to the casino each day during that same window. And we use that to come up with an estimate of reach. So that indicates that on average each day, the GameSense advisors were directly connecting with about 0.67% uh, of casino patrons. What was the window, Doctor? The window, the dates, it was December 2015 to May 2016. So what happens when a customer comes more than once to the casino? Yep, that's part of um, the number. They would be counted twice. Okay. Um, but also, if a, um, a visitor spoke to a GameSense advisor more than once in a day, that would also be counted twice. So we describe in the report that um, there's some uncertainty, but it's, it's present in both counts, the numerator and the denominator. Okay. So now we start to look at how the GameSense advisors were, uh, hmm, that's strange, uh, categorizing their interactions. We have a little uh, glitch here. Um, you see that um, they categorized their interactions. 70% um, of them were simple. And again, that was something like giving directions or a simple greeting. 13% were instructive. The mystery category there is demonstration. And that was just 1%. So when they started, they didn't um, have a lot of demonstrations that they were using regularly. That increased. And about 16% were those exchange interactions where they had a, a real conversation. Now we have some visitor survey findings. So one of the questions we asked, and we asked this of everyone who completed a survey, was, um, did you have any of the following concerns when you began your conversation with a GameSense advisor? In other words, what prompted you to speak to the GameSense advisor? And you can see that about 70% of them said that they were curious about GameSense. And this is not surprising. It was a new program. They didn't know who were these, green, <laughs> these people with the green shirts and what were they all about, and they wanted to find out. And you can see that the other options were endorsed less often. So for instance, 39% said that they spoke to a GameSense advisor because they wanted to learn more about how gambling works. About 2.5% said that they wanted help or information about problem gambling. And that's something that we saw often is that that more extreme level of help was um, not often reported. We asked, did you learn about any of the following? And we asked this among a smaller group of people. Um, so 77% or so said that they learned strategies to keep gambling fun. And the numbers went down from there, 48.4% said they learned how gambling works. This was interesting because Play My Way hadn't uh, been implemented yet during this wave, but still 26.4% said they learned how the play management, it didn't have a name yet, um, would work. Um, what it would be, and so we think that the GameSense advisors were anticipating this program and already speaking um, to patrons about it. Now we asked, how satisfied are you with your interaction with the GameSense advisor? And you can see that 77.8% said they were extremely satisfied. And um, that was the the biggest category, of course, 16.7% uh, said they were very satisfied. We asked, as a result of your conversation with the GameSense advisor, will you do any of the following? And they could 
uh, select as many as they wanted. The most often selected answer was tell someone about the Game Sense Info Center, and 56.9% of people endorsed that option. Now, we have no way of knowing whether they actually did any of these things, but this is at least what they said that they would do as a result of that conversation. And we included both the options, reduce my gambling behaviors and increase my gambling behaviors because we didn't go into this um, with any assumptions that the direction, that it would only go in one direction. It, it, we know that public health programs often have unintended consequences and wanted to leave that option open. Now I'm going to turn to report two. In this case, the Game Sense Advisors recorded 7,878 interactions or about 44 a day. And these interactions involved 16,993 visitors, most of whom were patrons. That was true in the first wave as well. And that translates to about 94 visitors a day, or about 1.33% of casino patrons. So that's another estimate of reach. In terms of how they categorize their interactions, this is similar to report one. In, the, in report one, 70% were simple. In report two, 73% were simple. 15% were instructive. 2% were demonstration. And 10% were exchange. So we asked a question about uh, how they might uh, Again, this is only for exchange visitors, people who had a conversation with a GameSense advisor, um, about how they might um, hy hypothetically use those GameSense advisors in the future. We asked, if you felt you were starting to lose control over your gambling, would you feel comfortable asking a GameSense advisor for help? And here we have a distinction that I'm introducing for the first time between first-time respondents, or people who completed a survey for the first time, and repeat respondents who are completing a survey for a um, second time. So you can see that among first-time respondents, 89% answered yes to this question, 11% said they weren't sure, and none said no. And among repeat respondents, 97% said yes, they'd feel comfortable asking Gameson's advisor for help. 2% weren't sure, and 1% said no. Now, you might remember this question from the first round. Um, in the first round, we asked, will you do any of these things as a result of your conversation? So we repeated that question for first-time survey respondents. And then we also asked it among repeat respondents to try to get a sense of, do people do what they say they're going to do? Oh, I'm sorry, I've jumped ahead here. This is a question of why they talked to a game sense advisor. Sorry about that. Um, so this question, um, we see that for first time respondents, similar to the first round, about 77% um, said that they spoke to a game sense advisor simply because they were curious. And you can see that that drops among repeat respondents. So after people are repeatedly, you know, uh, interacting with game sense advisors, that curiosity isn't driving them anymore. For the repeat respondents, the most uh, frequently endorsed option was, I wanted to learn more about strategies to keep gambling fun. And that was at 61.2%. Again, you can see in the very bottom row that it was rare for people to say they spoke to a game sense advisor because they wanted information or help about a gambling problem. Yes. Doctor, remind me, how is repeat defined here? Sure. Um, so if um, someone um, had an exchange with a game sense advisor, um, and that person indicated that they had never completed a survey before. They were asked to complete a survey, and they were considered a first-time responder. And we knew that it was a first-time respondent when we looked at the data because it was on a different color of paper. And so, if they had a conversation with a game sense advisor and they said, "Yes, I've already done a survey," then the game sense advisor would administer. I think, a green survey, and it had some somewhat overlapping questions and some new questions. And so we could tell which was which. So there's only one repeat? Yes, they were only asked to do it um, twice at the most. 
Is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah. After uh, the, the repeat only, um, it, it only means a second interaction. It but doesn't mean a, a second. A, a second meaningful interaction, or what? Uh, what was um, exchange? A second so exchange. This is, a, this is an important distinction. So it's it doesn't um, tell us how many times they've had an exchange. Um, it tells us how many times they've done a survey. Now, ideally, they do a survey after every um, exchange. That was our intention with uh, Game Sense Advisors. And in fact, their response rates were really high. It was 85% in round one, and I believe 79% in round two. But wouldn't that so, turn off the respondent, potentially? Um, to yeah. ask them. To, have, to ask them to do every, every time there's an interaction, to ask them to do a survey. Um, An exchange. You mean would it turn them off from speaking to a game sense advisor? No, from filling out the survey. Um, like I already, I already filled it out. Right. So that's why we didn't ask them to do it more than twice. Mm -hmm. And I think the game sense advisors were pretty good at emphasizing, yeah, we know you did this before, but this one has slightly different questions. Mm -hmm. There's a. There's, did you want to add anything? Um, I would also said. So, uh, the game sense advisors do roughly 90% plus of the voluntary self-exclusions. And individuals that um, entered into the voluntary self-exclusion program through the game sense, with a game sense advisor, were not asked to complete a survey, correct? Not for this, because they were doing one for our evaluation of the voluntary self-exclusion right. program. Right. So um, I, I just want to emphasize that mm -hmm. in terms of the I wanted information uh, or help about problem gambling and mm -hmm. it would those that group that specifically came to the game sense information center um, for help were not counted in in that mm -hmm. category that's true great mm -hmm. um, and just while we're on this topic of repeat versus first time um, another distinction I want to make is that it doesn't tell us how many total interactions a person had with a game sense advisor so they could have had 30, 40 simple interactions, um, and then, um, or instructive or demonstration, and then the first time they have an exchange, that's when they're first asked for a survey. So their total gain sense exposure, if we consider all the different kinds of interactions, is separate from whether they're first time or repeat. And that'll become important with some future findings. Okay, so now I'm getting back to the one that I already introduced. Uh, and this is the question of, as a result of your conversation with a game sense advisor, will you do any of the following? Or it was worded for the repeat respondents, did you do any of the following? All right, so here we see that 68.2% of first time respondents said, I will seek out information about how to keep gambling fun. And then about 54% of the repeat respondents said that they did do that after their conversation. Where is it, 54? 54.3% of the repeat the re respondents. Oh, no, sorry, I was looking at it. Yep. It's the last column on the right. The number. Um, and then we asked, uh, one of the options was, I will think about changing my own gambling behavior. And 36.9% of first time respondents said that they would do that. And 38.8% of the repeat respondents said that they did do that. They did think about changing their gambling behavior. And this uh, corresponds to a pre-contemplative stage of change, if you're familiar with stages of change and um, how it relates to, um, to changing one's own behavior. So they're thinking about making a change, but aren't quite ready to do it yet. Moving on. I'm just to, yeah, but just to clarify on that point, mm -hmm. um, the stages of change, if they're pre-contemplative, they're, mm -hmm. they're not willing to consider, they're, they don't even think about making the change. Mm -hmm. But the significance to me of this finding is that it's, it's indicating to me that perhaps they're moving down through the stages of change and that they're perhaps um, moving into the um, mm -hmm. contemplation mm -hmm. or even preparation um, prior to, to the action mm -hmm. stage. So. Um, I would take that as, as a very positive mm -hmm. finding that, that perhaps even if there's not a behavior change that we can measure, mm -hmm. that there, there's movement in, mm -hmm. in the stages of change. Mm -hmm. And then we also see um, similar, uh, along similar lines, we see that 22.1% said that I will 
spend less time or money gambling, and then 26.4% said that they did spend less time or money gambling. So those might be even in a further stage mm -hmm. right. of change. Um, yeah, what I noticed from this chart, and maybe this is kind of like what you're talking about, is that there's one that goes down, the first one, the fun part, goes down between the first and the repeat. But the other three, the responsible ones, go up, mm -hmm. right? Right, and so it might have something to do with their reasons for going to talk to the gamesman's advisor more than one time in the first place. So they might already have been more seriously thinking about changing their behavior, and that's what prompted them to talk to the gamesman's advisor. Right. Did we do a statistical compare? We did not. So no. You couldn't. So even though the percentages mm -hmm. look like they might be going up and down. It is possible that statistically speaking, they're the same. Yes, um, and they're not margin of errors. That's, that's great to the next slide, but hold that thought. Yeah, we couldn't do, um, we couldn't do statistical tests on this because the surveys were completely anonymous. That goes to the concern about um, the burden on the participants, whether they would want to complete a survey if we were asked for their name. So there was no way to track from one person's first time survey to their repeat survey, um, or to know uh, the degree of overlap. Okay, let's look at this one. Okay, so now we're starting to look at total game sense exposure. And if you remember a few minutes ago, I told you that there was a count for each person about how many total interactions they had had with a GameSense advisor of all four types. Of course, we had to rely on the, um, the patrons and other visitors to give us that number, their best estimate. We had no way of tracking that. So we started to look at the relationships between that total GameSense exposure and some um, uh, thoughts and behaviors. So what we found among the first-time respondents was that total game sense exposure was unrelated to all of the 15 responsible gambling knowledge and behavior outcomes. And those would be things like um, whether they've used a certain responsible gambling strategy in the past year or whether they answer correctly to questions about um, the most likely outcome of, of a slot machine play. How you know what, I'll let you finish this slide, okay. but I have a question because it's, sure. it's to each of the findings. Sure. So we saw the same thing when we considered the questions that un fell under the category of reactions to game sense. This is more along the satisfaction questions, like whether they would recommend game sense to a friend. Here we saw that um, total game sense exposure was unrelated to most of the resources and treatment knowledge outcomes except several outcomes um, that involved play my way. So for instance, um, people who had had more total interactions were more likely to be aware of play my way, more likely to be aware of their local gambling treatment resources, more likely to understand how play my way works, and more likely to identify correctly the purpose of play my way. So for instance, um, if you look at the question of, you know, whether they understand how Play My Way works, the people who answered that question correctly reported about 3.5 total interactions with the GameSense advisor. The people who answered it incorrectly reported about 1.5. And finally, among the repeat survey respondents, the, that total GameSense exposure wasn't related to any of the survey responses. How can you tell they're unrelated? Well, in this case, um, a lot of these questions were a simple right or wrong answer. And so we looked at the groups of people who got it right and the groups of people who got it wrong. And then we looked at how many um, total interactions each group reported, again, relying on their best estimate of how many interactions they had had. And then we did a statistical test to see if that count of interactions was different between the two groups. And the got it right means, like, let's say, a, a, a gambling myth? Um, or what is, what, is, what is the getting it right? Um, I can give you some examples, if you'll bear with me just for a minute. Um, 
I believe. So for one of the game sense questions, it was, uh, maybe I'll just look at it rather than give you my best uh, estimate. Let's see. That's the Sydney report. So a question like, how does play my way work? The correct answer is players set limits and get notifications when they are close to or reach their limits. That's the right answer. A wrong answer would be something like, players set limits and can't gamble anymore once they reach their limits. What page are you on? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm on page 101. Another question about the purpose of Play My Way. This question is simply, what's the purpose of Play My Way? And the, the correct answer is to help players monitor their gambling. This is on page 103. Um, and an incorrect answer would be to put a limit on how much people can gamble. But um, mm -hmm. most people, regardless of their exposure, yes. answered the questions correctly, yep. right? So could it, could it also be just a, a factor of the, of the questions that were asked and so that wasn't necessarily a very good indicator of, of the impact of um, exposure to to game sense? Game sense, yeah. Yep, we talk about the potential for a ceiling effect in the limitations in the report and in the presentation today. For some of these questions, there is a possibility that the, um, the rate of answering correctly was so high that the game sense advisors really couldn't push it in one way or the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. LaClaide's pointing out on page 103 that 86% um, of first-time survey respondents answered the question, what is the purpose of Play My Way correctly, compared to 95.3% of repeat visitor respondents. So um, those um, rates of answering that question particularly were pretty high. Mm -hmm. um, and that might be because the Game Sense Advisors are doing a good job of explaining how the program works. Okay, now I'm going to move on to the third report. Sigma surveyed 479 patrons, and this is a different population. Recall that in reports one and two, we were looking at a segment of a segment, right? So just the people who had exchange interactions with Game Sense Advisors. Here, they really broadened it. They opened it up to anyone who happened to be in the casino on the day that they were surveying. And they intercepted people on their way out of the, sur of the casino. And their response rate was 22.4%. And, and if I may, the, this survey conducted by Sigma, the patron intercept survey, um, the game sense questions were, were a small part of a much larger survey. And that, the, the original intention of that um, effort by Sigma was the piece about trying to understand um, uh, where players are, are coming from, whether they're coming from out of state or in state, and what their, their spend is both at the casino and in their surrounding area. And at the end, there was a, uh, a series of questions re about, about game sense, um, uh, knowledge, and um, exposure. So we started the game sense section of the survey with a pretty basic question of are you aware of the Game Sense program? We found that 56.9% were aware of the program. Again, this is people who were on the casino floor on their way out. And we asked those people, well, Sigma asked those people, have you spoken to a Game Sense advisor? And they found that 18.1% said yes. Um, this is another estimate of reach. Um, and that corresponds to 9.6% of all respondents. And just, uh, just to be clear, the, um, the intercept happened at all three entrances or exits to the casino, not just the, the entrance or exit right near the Game Sense Information Center. But it, but it was a random sampling, right? It was every, however, one out of every six people, so you have a good yes. broad sample. Mm -hmm. Much broader than our visitor surveys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
That was why we, that was the purpose. And in this one, we, um, we already account for the repeat factor. Mm -hmm. um, because they're telling us, um, yeah. Yeah, th because this is coming from the patrons themselves. This isn't coming from an estimate provided by the Game Sense Advisors. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, you might start to notice a trend here. 98% said that they were satisfied with the information provided by the Game Sense Advisor. And um, most of them thought that their particular Game Sense Advisor was helpful. About 91% either agreed or agreed strongly that their game sense advisor was helpful. None of them disagreed. 59% um, said they learned something new about gambling. And we asked, did your interaction with the game sense advisor change the way you gamble? And we observed that 58% said no. This gets cut off a little bit, but it's 20% who said, yes, I've changed how I think about my gambling, but I have not changed my, how I actually gamble. And 22% said, yes, I have changed how I gamble. And if you recall back to a few slides, we saw about 24% or so of people in our surveys were saying that they had changed how they gamble as a result of their conversation. So, so highlighting some consistent findings. So for the most part, we didn't find associations between game sense exposure and their self-reported gambling activity on the day of the survey. So I'll show you two findings here. If we look at how much they reported spending on the day of the survey, the people who were aware of game sense spent about the same as those who weren't aware of game sense. And then the people who had spoken to a game sense advisor spent about the same as those who did not speak to a game sense advisor. You might notice a um, slight difference there in the amount spent, but it wasn't um, statistically significant. So we'll call those even. Um, now moving on to our last report. And this, as I mentioned, was our survey of Plain Ridge Park employees. We had 258 of them complete a survey. They did so at uh, one of four town hall style meetings. Um, we got about 72% of people who attended the town halls. Unfortunately, not all of them attended a town hall, even though it was described as mandatory. So our sample represents 52% of all the employees at that time. We found that 58.5% said that they had interacted with a game sense advisor. And then we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into this question of you know, what was the conversation like? And so we asked, did you talk to a game sense advisor about problem gambling or responsible gambling? And we saw that 33.5% had done so. So presumably the rest of them had just had a casual conversation with a game sense advisor. We found that most people, 71.4%, had never referred a patron to a, a game sense advisor. And most of the time of those people, 88.1% um, said it was simply because they hadn't, the opportunity had never come up. They had never felt a reason to refer someone to a Game Sense Advisor. We found that this exposure to Game Sense Advisors was highest among security and surveillance employees, which makes sense, and lowest among food, beverage, and retail employees. We asked a series of questions to try to understand their understanding of the Game Sense program, given that, especially because this program was so new, um, we wanted to know whether they understood how it works and what it's all about. So one of the questions was, um, what do Game Sense advisors do? We found that they were aware that Game Sense advisors are responsible for greeting people, teaching people to avoid gambling beyond their limits, enrolling people in Play My Way enrolling people in voluntary self-exclusion, and helping to connect people to problem gambling or other mental health treatment. But at the same time, they weren't aware that Game Sense Advisors are responsible for giving people directions, teaching about odds and probabilities, teaching people how to play the casino games, unenrolling people from Play My Way, and unenrolling people from voluntary self-exclusion. 
one of the questions was who can use the game sense program so most but not all respondents understood that casino patrons can use game sense 88.9 percent um, about two months before our survey the employees at Plainridge Park had gotten a, a newsletter that specifically said that they too can use the program as a personal resource, but only 37.9% knew it at the time of our survey. This might be um, some room for improvement in, as far as their, their training and understanding of the program. So we found that 42.7% of the employees correctly identified how Play My Way works. Now, of course, the Game Sense advisors themselves are mostly responsible, are, they are responsible for enrolling patrons in Play My Way, but there could be opportunities for other employees to discuss the program, and so it's useful to know, do they understand it? And only 9.1% accurately identified the characteristics of the voluntary self-exclusion program at Plain Ridge Park. Mark, remind me if our PPC employees restricted from gambling at PPC? Yes. I wonder if that at least potentially partially explains the low number, seemingly low number of employees who think they can use it as a resource. Yeah. Mm. You know, it's um, casino employees are a, 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 a higher risk, high risk group. A high risk group. Um, and I agree with, with, with Heather um, that that's probably something that we can take a look at when we think about how we're, we're communicating with casino employees, what the purpose of the GameSense program and who, who it's for. So, um, absolutely. Moving on. Um, we asked about employees' opinions about the GameSense program. Because again, this is something they could um, communicate to patrons, whether they intend to or not, their, their opinions about the program could uh, be communicated to the patrons. And so we asked, one of the opinion questions was, do you agree or not? Game Sense encourages people to think about their own gambling behavior. And most people agreed, 86%. And then we balanced this with potential negative impacts, like Game Sense interferes with player enjoyment. We found that 60% disagreed with that statement. 18% agreed that Game Sense does interfere with player enjoyment, and 22% didn't know. Employee exposure to Game Sense is so simply have you ever spoken to a Game Sense advisor? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, it, um, just, it, it just reminded me of a finding, I think it was from the first survey, that talked about what, uh, whether or not it enhanced their mm. visit to Plain Ridge Park Casino, that mm -hmm. I don't think that you captured in the PowerPoint. But it's an interesting contrast to that, that specific question or perception of, of PPC employees. Right. So if you ask people who um, had a conversation with a game sense advisor whether it enhanced their experience that day, most of them said yes. Mm -hmm. OK. So um, we looked to see whether people who had interacted with a game sense advisor responded differently than those who hadn't. Found that for the most part, um, that was unrelated. So, um, but I'll, I'll highlight where it was related. Respondents who had ever interacted with the Game Census Advisor were more likely to be able to identify what the Game Sense Advisors did, understand how Play My Way works, and correctly answer one of our questions uh, about the independence of slot machine play but they weren't more likely to know that they can use GameSense as a personal resource, understand how voluntary self-exclusion works. Sorry, you won't be able to read that. I don't think I can either. Um, I can read that right here. Let's see, understand their own role in intervening with patrons with potential gambling-related problems, um, and have positive or negative opinions about the program. So if, if you're an employee who works and say, uh, one of the restaurants, and you've had an interaction with the Game Sense Advisor, your opinions about the program are the same as someone who hadn't. Um, that one, sorry, that's the last one there. The one that's tough to read, I'll just point out, we asked um, if they understood their role in the system. Um, the questions were, um, let's see, 
Should Play My Way employees try to determine if a patron has a gambling problem? Um, only half of them knew that they should not try to do that. Um, it's, it's not on here, so I'll just say it. And then 64% um, knew that they weren't um, supposed to intervene with someone whom they thought had a gambling problem. So those are some other potential uh, room for improvement. So I think I'm at my conclusions now. Thanks for bearing with me through all these findings. First, in terms of reach, we had a few estimates of reach. In our first two reports where we relied on those, um, the census of GameSense Advisors activities, our estimates were about 1%. And about 70% of those were simple, superficial. In the Sigma report, the estimate was closer to 10%. So we conclude that at least during our windows of observation, interactions that directly relate to promoting responsible gambling among casino venue patrons were rare. So questions for you would be, um, does this extent of reach fulfill your program goals and is the cost per patron acceptable? We found across all of our reports high satisfaction with the program and with the Game Sense Advisors. Another consistent finding was most respondents who had spoken with a Game Sense Advisor reported that they had learned something new about gambling or strategies to keep gambling fun. And about 20% reported changing their behavior as a result of their conversation. For the most part, respondents' responsible gambling knowledge and behavior was unrelated to their game sense exposure. That comes from report two. Can I, can the exception. I, can I go back a little bit? Sure. To the um, previous slide or? The first one. Just this one? one more. Yeah. Um, the way you laid it out, it would assume that um, the cost, the benefit, is equal to all patrons, but we know that in this industry, mm -hmm. this industry heavily relies on a small uh, piece of the population to get most of the revenues. Mm -hmm. um, have you thought about how, whether that has a cost benefit? Whether that has a cost benefit? Affecting the right people, not mm -hmm. just everybody on average, mm -hmm. but for the sake of argument, the atypical player, this is a term you came up with for the play my way, uh, or uh, those at risk or those experiencing problem gambling. Mm -hmm. Did you analyze that or is that part of a cost benefit analysis? I think I understand. I, I think that um, this particular evaluation wasn't designed really to do a full cost benefit analysis. And I think that if you were to kind of advance in that direction, that those are things that certainly you would want to consider is, you know, who are the, the best targets and whether or not your reach within particular target groups goes up and down um, and what you want your reach to be for particular target groups. I think that that's what yep. you're saying. And I think that that's something that would be really valuable to integrate into a, a formal uh, cost benefit analysis. Right. Right. And I, I think that reach also needs to not be narrowly defined as an interaction with a GameSense mm -hmm. advisor, but the, the extent at which the, the GameSense program um, works across a spectrum of different types of, of, of providing information in different types of ways. Um, Certainly, and as I said in my opening remarks, that the uh, interaction with the GameSense advisor or the GameSense advisors are the heart of this program. Um, but there's that, but it's not right for every every patron. And that GameSense um, is expressed on the in the casino, and for that matter, outside of the casino, and in different ways. Yeah, we agree with that. I think that one of the conclusions in our report is that. We could go beyond just looking at GameSense advisor interactions and look at reach involved with things like websites and mm -hmm. pamphlets and in other ways of uh, information distribution. You do some commercials and things like that. So I think a formal analysis that incorporates all of those potential avenues um, would be important. And 
uh, our particular evaluation at this point wasn't designed to go in that level of detail, but hopefully this provides some early preliminary information that points you in the right direction. Thank you. Just to mention that an exception here um, concerned Play My Way. We found that both patrons and employees who had interacted with a Game Sense advisor tended to know more about Play My Way. And we think that, again, it goes back to um, the Game Sense advisors um, being really um, um, enthusiastic about describing the program and how it works. And especially because our second round of data collection happened just two months after Play My Way was implemented. So it was really on their minds. And they were doing a good job of describing it. Um, I know you're also evaluating Play My Way, but um, remind me or, or tell me if this is something that I just came up on my own, but um, is it fair to attribute the rate of usage to Play My Way uh, at least partially to the game sense advisor interaction just by the number of people that sign up at the kiosk as opposed to the machine for example right you using play my way right yeah we did count and wave to um, the, the Game Sense advisors gave us an estimate of how many people were coming up to them with questions about Play My Way and how many were saying good or bad things about Play My Way. And there were a lot of conversations. So I would um, uh, suppose that the Game Sense advisors were encouraging people to enroll. Also, they had incentives to, en uh, to enroll. The patrons themselves had incentives. Right. Well, you know, it's one thing for uh, for me to sign up if a machine tells me, but mm. what if the person I know and I always say hi to yes. says, you know, here, we're doing a promotion. Yes. Yep. Makes sense. Okay, so some cross-report uh, limitations. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, our visitor surveys don't represent all of the casino patrons, only those who chose to discuss problem gambling or responsible gambling with game sense advisors. Because of the nature of our evaluation, we can't establish any causal effects. We can't say that GameSense did something or did not do something. Um, it would take a more rigorous evaluation design to, to establish those causal pathways. Um, halo effects refer to the visitors' perceptions of the GameSense advisors. You might remember um, that from our first presentation here, we asked not just um, was the game sense advisor helpful, but you know, were they knowledgeable? Were they caring? Did they listen to you? And they had really high evaluations of the game sense advisors on all of those dimensions. It's possible, we know from other research in this area, that usually what will happen is a person has a real um, general, uh, either positive or negative impression of someone. Like you think about your server at a restaurant, you either like them or you don't. And then that, uh, if it's positive, it's a halo effect where you say, yes, every dimension they're great at. And we think that that's probably happening to some extent here. It doesn't take away from the fact that the visitors really liked the game sense advisors. And that would be at the heart of a halo effect. We talked earlier about a ceiling effect or restriction of range, where if people um, mostly already know the correct answer, then the game sense advisors would have trouble pushing it up any further. Mm -hmm. We think that might have happened with some of the questions. Interesting. Some recommendations. Now, um, in the report, um, for each of the four reports, we made recommendations, and the commission responded to uh, many of them as we were going. And they've already, for instance, made efforts to increase GameSense Advisors' clinical supervision on the basis of some of our observations. Um, they took some steps to improve the messaging to increase game sense awareness. Some current program evaluations are to repeatedly evaluate the legislative fit um, as the ability of game sense info centers to address substance and mental health issues remains unclear. Can I um, just, what do you mean by legislative fit in this context? I think this goes back to the point you raised at the beginning about whether game sense is 
it's only designed um, to fulfill this legislative mandate or has a broader role. So um, if game sense has the broader role um, that you mentioned earlier, then that legislative fit might not be so much of a question. It's just when we see in the legislation um, mental health and substance use issues as part of the counseling service, we know from our work with game sense that that's not typically covered. And so we see sort of a disconnect there. Is that what you think the legislature intended? Well, we're just basing it on what the legislation says. In that one instance, not right. the broader Exactly. The broader interpretation. Right. I mean, would you would you have a counseling center at a casino, for example? <laughs> I'm not a commissioner and I don't think I would I would answer well, that question. Have you no. have you seen it anywhere else in the country? I don't believe so. No. Or the world for that matter. Hmm. Actually, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I wouldn't be surprised if, if some did. Or at least tried to. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's necessarily an, uh, that we're advocating that that happens. Mm -hmm. um, and, but maybe it's a change. Maybe striking that part from the legislation if it doesn't make sense um, to all of you. Well, we do have the power to interpret our own statute, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we feel we have. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, was, I was thinking about that this morning, um, trying to go back to the number of meetings that we had to resolve a number of policy questions. I couldn't yeah. recall whether that one came up and well, we decided as a group, it's like, well, that just doesn't make yes, sense. Yeah. That's like, we have, we have done a number at a, at a bar. I mean, it doesn't. I, actually, you speak quite a bit about you know, first do no harm. I think that if we were trying to read the letter, uh, mm -hmm. the specific letter of that one sentence about the on-site space mm -hmm. to provide um, counseling services, uh, it would actually potentially produce more harm. I will say that the Game Sense Advisors, um, as a result of some of our earlier observations, um, got some more training and they particularly got uh, mental health first aid training, which covers, I've gone through it myself, some of you might have as well. It covers a whole range of issues, including substance use and mental health issues. So they might be more prepared to deal with those kinds of crises than we know. The, the Game Sense Advisors, in fact, currently are in the midst of a um, four-week orientation for the new Game Sense Advisors coming on, and it was true with Plain Ridge Park Casino. But they have extensive training, and um, as you said, they they go through the mental health first aid. Mm -hmm. um, they go through the the basics of motivational <coughs> interviewing, um, problem uh, gambling 101, and in fact, advanced camp, um, advanced um, coursework in that. Um, they visit a, a, a GA meeting in, in the area. Um, they're uh, familiar with, they're, they're oriented to the services, mental health, substance abuse, other, other services that, that exist within the community where, where, they're, where they're working. Um, and so while um, they are not clinicians, or I guess that's not entirely true, but most of them are not clinicians, um, I would not envision um, counseling services being provided on space, but they are equipped with um, some of the very basic skills and knowledge that, that would, uh, that would um, equip them to address um, a range of different issues that they would be presented with um, when a patron is in distress. Which is what Commissioner Stevens was alluding to some of the earlier conversations mm -hmm. when, we, um, when we decided with this program. Okay. And I'll wrap up here. Our final set of recommendations concern the evaluation of the program. So we recommend uh, establishing objectives for instance, to do with REACH um, that can be measured and um, that the Commission um, invest in measuring progress toward those objectives at Plain Ridge Park Casino and at the two forthcoming info centers. I think on the basis of the data we've collected so far, it's premature to conclude that GameSense promotes positive play among most patrons or increases players' knowledge of how games work while dispelling common gambling myths. Um, and that future work could document those kinds of effects by investing in randomized controlled trials where you assess positive play before and after game sense exposure. 
Thank you again. Thank you very much. Um, all right, let me go to uh, questions uh, from fellow commissioners, if any. Yeah, I, I would, in, not to put Mark on the spot, but, you know, be curious at some point, talking with you and Teresa, as to what the results showed, strategies or kind of next steps that you're going to undertake, as well as you think about the site at Springfield. It's going to be different than PPC. It's a different layout. Yeah. You know, and, and I know we're awaiting a presentation from uh, you, and, you and Elaine, I think, in the coming weeks, and kind of the new rollout, the new image yeah. in, in advertising for the program. Like, yeah, and it's, um, I, I'm really excited about some of the, the findings in here, um, that it highlights some areas that I think that we can, we can really expand on. Um, so, for example, you know, the, the demonstration and in interactive types of interactions is, is quite low, um, and I think that it would highlight our need to continue to develop new games to engage patrons with, um, keep those games fresh, keep the Game Sense advisors excited about doing those so that we could see that type of interaction grow, because it, it, I, I really do believe that, that, that those types of interactions are effective at promoting the overall goals of the program. Um, I think that there's there's great opportunity in working with um, casino operators in in both the sort of basic training of GameSense, so new employee training of GameSense, but as well um, ongoing training of, of of GameSense, up to and including really letting them know that this is a resource for for the the employees at the at the casinos. Um, there's there's a host of other ways in which I think that this evaluation. Um, will be really, really helpful for us um, in, in moving, moving the program and advancing it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that uh, very much. The, the, the employees, uh, the reach, the demonstration, you know, it's easy to fall into um, whatever, the raffle that works or the marbles, the bag of marbles, yeah. but somebody might just quickly say, I've already, I've already seen that one, uh, and, and, and yeah. bypass it. Um, you know, if we're trying to keep doing that over and over, I think it cuts to the heart of the how slot machines work. But um, but you're right, thinking creatively is something we should we should think about. Um, Commissioner uh, Cameron, are you if you're still uh, with us? Do you have any comments for our uh, group of researchers? I'm going to take that as a perhaps not. Maybe she put it on mute, or maybe. Uh, Hey, Carol, can you hear me? Can oh, you hear me? Uh, you yes, go. yes, I can Sorry. hear you, Commissioner. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, listen, I, I thought it was a very interesting presentation, informative, and you, uh, Mark and Commissioner Zuniga, you just made my point that I was going to make, which is the whole reason for an evaluation is to, is to then incorporate uh, and improve the process. And, you know, uh, Sharing these results with both uh, the Game Sense advisors and the uh, operators, I think, is a critical piece. And then, you know, really tweaking what is a very good um, program uh, to make right. it stronger. And Mark, you just made that point. And uh, so those were my thoughts on listening to the evaluation, how important it is to then incorporate the findings uh, to strengthen the program. Yeah, no, um, I think uh, we're all committed to the ongoing evaluation of everything that, the research and evaluation that, of everything uh, we do. Uh, and I think there's great uh, roadmap of a number of things for us to follow up on this. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gray and LaPlante. Thank this you. Was great. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, um, is that, does that conclude the item under um, Director van der Linden? Yes. Yes, it does. Thank you. Great. Um, well, I was thinking uh, we might need a, a break, but it uh, doesn't, doesn't appear. Um, we should uh, keep um, the next item on the agenda because we already got through number four, would be the commissioner updates. Uh, I, have, I have just two real quickly. Um, Director Griffin and I were informed um, by the folks at MGM that it looks like October 9th, which is going to be our, is expected to be our kind of last AOC meeting out in Springfield, our wrap-up that MGM is planning a 
diversity celebration uh, post it after the AOC meeting, and certainly that's something that we're all invited to. So her, certainly hope we can uh, all add that to our schedules. And uh, and again, because of what I think has been a, a good working relationship with the skills cabinet, they informed us that uh, uh, it appears they're going to make a capital investment into Bunker Hill Community College to upgrade some of their culinary space, again, to help address a lot of the local workforce shortages in, in terms of culinary. So just those two items to share with you. Very good. Yeah, that process, that AOC process has been, in my estimation, uh, greatly received by that, um, by that community, the overall community of um, business leaders, advocates, and uh, diversity advocates. And, uh, yeah, the whole process, and I, I, I think if you talk to MGM, they want, uh, you know, they're hoping that other stakeholders in the region can kind of uh, pick up the example they've set and kind of carry it forward into new construction projects as the region continues to grow. Right. And Director Griffin has done a fantastic job chairing that committee, I might add. Um, Commissioner O'Brien, any updates? Um, Commissioner uh, Cameron, any updates on your end? Uh, nothing now, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll just mention that uh, I just came from the, um, uh, the conference, the annual conference of the National Council on Problem Gambling. Um, there were, uh, we continue to be recognized as um, quite progressive and ahead of the pack when it comes to all the research and evaluation that we're doing of programs. There were a lot of discussion around sports betting, for example, and the keynote speaker, many in the panels uh, on, the, on the general sessions and the breakout sessions, all point to if you're going to do expand uh, into sports betting, take a look at what, what Massachusetts did when they expanded into casino gaming put resources for research, put resource, resources in um, program evaluation, and, uh, and harm mitigation, uh, which, again, continues to be just a theme that, 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 that for which we are re recognized, uh, not just nationally, but um, internationally. Uh, there, was, there were two delegations um, in that, um, uh, um, in that uh, conference one from Japan and one from Saipan. Uh, the people from Japan came uh, just this, at, at the beginning of this week, came to uh, Massachusetts. We had arranged for this in advance to that conference um, to take a look at the Game Sense uh, Center uh, and play my way mm -hmm. because they are quite interested in um, implementing those uh, uh, or advocating for those, for the implementation of those uh, programs. Um, in the newly approved uh, uh, Japan expansion or casino expansion. Um, secondly, the, uh, the, we met people from Saipan who want to come in September. They did not want to come in the winter uh, for, <laughs> for climate what? reasons, purely for climate reasons, but they want to come and, and, and take a look at the same thing. Same uh, game sense, play my way. Uh, again, uh, uh, um, approaches in the United States that have never been done uh, before and for which we continue to get to take a lot of credit. So I just wanted That's to, oh, um, and one last thing, uh, MGM uh, received the Corporate Social Responsibility Award um, mm -hmm. in, that, uh, in that conference, largely due to their efforts on GameSense at a corporate level. Uh, so even our licensees are getting some recognition, quite a bit of recognition, I might add. Um, on these efforts. That's great. You know, it's interesting. This isn't the first time that we've had um, folks visiting us from Japan, um, in this case, to look at GameSense, but um, I remember, I think it was uh, consultants came to look at how we did the process of where to award a casino license. So they were here, I think, over a year ago to kind of explore that process with local officials. So. Hopefully, we're a, we're, we're a good example for them to follow. Right. Well, and to be fair, we did a lot of what they're doing and um, and came up with uh, these programs, you know, not on our own, but with the help of people who had already gone through it. 
Okay, so um, if that's it for updates, um, there's no other business, Director, we're, we're all set. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motions made and second. Uh, Commissioner Stebbins? Yes. Commissioner O'Brien? Yes. Commissioner Cameron? Yes. And Commissioner Zuniga votes yes. Uh, four to zero, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. We're going to sign off, Commissioner Cameron. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.